presence of man. Welcome to my father's place. I am an ambassador to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And today I announce to you the terms of his kingdom. His desire is that you be reconciled to God. Everyone on earth is away from God until they come to Christ and then they are reconciled. The sin they committed is forgiven and he is ready to in an instant change your heart so it's no longer rebellious toward him. So I'm an ambassador and I'm coming in the name of the Lord this morning. The title of my message today is 40 Days of God's Purpose. And what I mean by that is God has a purpose. He has something he is purposing on this earth. And we're going to talk about that. Two great purposes that he has for two different sets of people. But let's pray first, because I can do nothing apart from Christ. 
Father, I come before you and I thank you that Christ lives and dwells in me, that you have made it so, that you reconciled me to yourself, that you showed me my sinful heart. And I turned away from it and said, clean me up. And Lord, you gloriously did. You forgave me for the sin I had committed. And then, Lord, you made my heart new, made me a new creature, just like your word says, so that I might go forth and your son, Father, might shine from me. And just the shining, Lord, would tear down all the strongholds in this world, everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of you, And it does by your grace. Jesus, I know this is your desire for your whole church. And I know that right now, not everyone in your church is in that place. You have set me on the wall. And you have shown me this, that I might speak your truth in the very love of you, in your very actual love which your Holy Spirit has poured out into my heart until it overflows, until I love your church with your love, until I love the world with your love, until I see the world through your eyes and see the loss through your eyes. Holy Spirit, you are the worker of all these things. Go forth and work today, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I'm a very passionate person when it comes to the Lord because he has done a very great thing and I'm not special. I'm not chosen. I'm not different than the rest of the Christians in the world. This is for every Christian and for everyone who will become a Christian because we truly have Jesus shining from us. The Bible teaches us that there are two great purposes of God because the Bible addresses not only the people of God, but also the people of the earth. So there are two things God purposes to do with those two separate groups, the ones that know him and the ones that don't. These purposes that he has, he accomplishes in many ways, but mostly I have found it's by putting us through trials, and I find that in the Word over and over and over again. The Bible shows me trials are what show us our own heart, the very depth of darkness that's in there. So that when that is revealed in these trials, we have two choices. We can reject what God is showing us, or we can receive it. And that goes for the church too. She can either reject what God is showing her today or receive it. If she receives it, then she repents from her sin. The church does. You, O oh Christian, if God shows you your heart today and you repent for your sin, which he is showing you today, then you will also ask him to change your heart because there's no way in yourself that you can be good enough or obey him. It's by him changing your heart, taking out the stony one and putting in one that responds to him. And he will do it. He's glad. He's waiting. He will do it in an instant. There's one prophet the Lord showed me through whom we can see both of God's purposes. The salvation of his people and the salvation of the world at large. Jonah, we probably, some of us remember him from Jonah and the whale or Jonah and the big fish. 
We may have heard about it in Sunday school and we vaguely remember the story. But before the book of Jonah in which that story is told, we need to look at what Jonah was told by God to say to Jeroboam, the second one. The first Jeroboam was a few kings earlier. This is the second Jeroboam, and he is just as wicked as the first Jeroboam was. He puts his children in the fire to false gods, literally sacrificing them, his own children. He builds all kinds of altars that are not gods and prays at them to gods that can't hear or see or think or answer. Let me read from 2 Kings 14, 25 through 27. You won't need to go there. Where I want you to go is to Jonah, which is a few books past Daniel in the Old Testament. 2 Kings 14, 25. He, this is King Jeroboam, restored the border of Israel from the entrance of Hamath as far as the Sea of the Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was of Gath Hefer. For the Lord saw the affliction of Israel, which was very bitter. For there was neither bond nor free, nor was there any helper for Israel. The Lord did not say that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, but he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. Now, in spite of the king's evil, the Lord saw the suffering of his people because they were being afflicted by their enemies. They were being knocked down. Their borders of Israel were being destroyed. And so because Jonah spoke this word, Jeroboam was given the ability and the favor to restore the borders. Despite the fact that Jeroboam was sinning wickedly. I tell you, O church, that Israel was spared despite her sin. And I tell you, O church, you have been spared many times despite your sin. And the Lord offered them many more opportunities to repent for their sin. Over the next 82 years and seven months, if Jonah began speaking at the time Jeroboam became king, which is what it appears to be in the word. He continued, God did, to send Israel prophets who warned, who were on the walls looking out and warned them to turn away from their sin. Their sin, their personal sin, and their sin as a nation against God because King Jeroboam was telling everyone to do the same as him. Zephaniah 3 4 says that in those days, the preachers and the teachers did violence to the law. That is, to the word of God. And by doing violence to it, I mean they twisted it, they mangled it, they reshaped it into what they wanted it to be, so that they could do what they wanted to do. I tell you, church, the same thing is happening today. There are many who are mangling the very word of God. So Israel was able to restore their borders because God had mercy on them, just as he has had mercy on you, O church. But there came a time at the end of those 82 years and seven months 
when the people still had not listened to all the brave prophets that he had sent forth to them, where God said, enough. I'm going to give you over to your enemies, the Assyrians. And he did. And they were routed by the Assyrians and many perished in the battles. Many perished in the battles. Many are perishing in battles against Satan in the church today. Many are being scattered by him. Many are going into exile. Separation from God. Because they rejected the warnings of the Lord, which he gave them in his love. If he did not love them, he would not warn them. He'd let them go. He'd let them be like lemmings jumping off a cliff, following one another. But he loved them enough to cry out through his prophets to them, just as church he does today. I'm not talking about modern day soothsaying Christian prophets who will tell you all kinds of good things about your future. I'm talking about ones who have heard a word from the Lord and speak it and are not afraid to. Ones that blow the trumpet of warning out of love and out of also knowing that if he tells us something and we don't say it, your blood is on us. So we see through Jeroboam and through Jonah's words that God's great desire was that they would turn from their sin. And he offered them not only the restoration of the borders, even when an evil king was in place, but also prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet saying, turn from your sin. And so we know from that, That God's purpose for his people is that they turn from their sin, even in the church today. This is what God the Father and God the Son, Jesus Christ, are seeking that you would turn from your personal sin to the only one that can clean you up. He makes strong and courageous the prophets that he sends. Christians must stop sinning, says the Lord. And that is only through repenting for your personal sin and asking God to cleanse your heart in a moment of time, changing it from the stony one, from the rebellious one, to the one that responds to God. I know from my own experience that did not happen when I was at an altar saying, I believe in Jesus. I was still rebellious after that. I still went my own way. I still sinned. But when I cried out to be filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit, entirely sanctified, he did it. By faith, I received it. And he entirely changed my heart. God's first purpose is saving his own people. In 2 Kings, it was Israel, and it still is today, Israel. But it's also the church, because we're his people too. We were adopted by the Father. But we must confess our sin, and we must ask him to change our heart. So that's God's first purpose seen through Jonah the prophet. What's his second purpose? His second great thing that he purposes to do in this world that he created by saying, let there be. 
He wants to save people who worship everything but him. That was me. He'll only do it if they repent of their wickedness, of their sin, of their rebellion. When he sends a prophet who declares the truth to them. I tell you. Now, Jonah was a prophet. I'm not going to read to you from Jonah, but I'm going to kind of tell you the story as it relates to you, church, and as it relates to the world at large that does not yet know him. The Lord tells him to go and preach to the people of Nineveh. That's the capital of Assyria, which 82 years and seven months later is going to overrun Israel, northern Israel, and lug them all off into captivity or kill them. This city is wicked. It's a very large city. It's the capital. And God wants Jonah to go and warn them of sin? They're great enemies. Why would he want to save them? And so his reaction is like James and John. When Jesus and his disciples came to a village in Samaria, a Samaritan village, and wanted to pass through, and the village said no, because you're going to Jerusalem, and we hate the people there. Like Jonah, James and John did not yet have the heart of God. That would happen at Pentecost, when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So in Luke 9, 54, when his disciples, James and John, saw this, that they had been rejected from passing through the village, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what spirit you are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village and crossed through there. God didn't come to lay the hammer down on the world without first inviting them through his son, whom he gave, that they may turn from their sin and repent and seek salvation through Christ to be saved from the sins they committed and to seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit, which would purify their hearts. So the Lord wants Jonah to warn Nineveh, wicked, wicked Nineveh, huge city, enemy. His attitude is the same as James and John. He'd like to call fire down on them like Sodom and Gomorrah. That's his desire. He's thinking Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, this is great, Lord. I'm not going to be like Abraham and ask if there's 10 righteous in the city. Will you save it? No, destroy the whole thing. Take them out, Lord. They've been a big bother to us. And so because he doesn't want to do what God wants him to do, he runs from the Lord hops on a ship, and the Lord brings a storm. When the church refuses to tell the world to repent from their sin, when they run from that which they are called by God to do and commanded by him to do, he will bring storms. The ship that Jonah is on is about to sink. The waves and the wind are horrific. He's sleeping below and has no idea, really. He's soundly sleeping. No one else on board knows the Lord. 
And so after a time, I mean, they're calling out to their gods and their gods aren't answering. And they say, well, this Jonah guy, he has a different God. Let's go get him and see if he calls out his God, if something will happen. Maybe they say, maybe his God will care about us and save us. And so, lots are cast to determine who's responsible for the storm. Jonah hasn't told them he is, although he well knows it. Lots are cast, and Jonah's name comes up. Then he confesses that he fears God that he worships and reveres God who created everything and that he's fleeing from the presence of the Lord. Well, they are absolutely apoplectic when they find that out. The God who created everything, this man is fleeing from him. They tried to fight the sea anyway, but the storm was too great. And then they prayed to the Lord, these men that were praying to their own gods, they prayed to the Lord and they said, save us. The storms that are brought into the church end up saving. Thanks be to God. Many who are lost, they will cry out. They say, Lord, don't let us perish. Don't blame us for throwing Jonah into the sea because he's the cause of this. He tells them, if you throw me into the sea, the sea will instantly be calm. So when they throw him overboard, it's just as Jonah said, instantly calm. Many storms come into this world because the church disobeys God. But God will use those storms, even when the church is disobedient. He doesn't desire for her to be disobedient. He is very grieved that she is disobedient, but he will use the evil that comes in because of her disobedience to save people who pray to other gods. He is a great God. The church tries to flee from the presence of the Lord when he says, go and preach to people that they are sinful and must repent. She wants to do anything but that. She doesn't want to warn them. They might be offended. Oh, church. It is the gospel. Jesus went out preaching continuously. Repent and believe the gospel. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Better to go into the kingdom of God with one eye than to go into everlasting burnings where the worm never dies. Church, he's sending a storm your way. You think things are tough in America right now and in the world? He's sending a storm. It's his mercy to you. Because something's going to happen to Jonah out of this. It's his mercy to Jonah to put him in the storm. It's his mercy to unbelievers. To put you in a storm, church. Because you won't cry out, turn from your sin. See, he'll save unbelievers who aren't responsible for the storm when they turn to him in that storm and cry out for him to save them. And just as the men who tossed Jonah overboard, they will worship 
the God of heaven, the one true God, because the sea instantly will become calm for them. And they will know that this is not like their gods to whom they prayed and nothing happened. This is the God of heaven, the one true God who is over everything. Hallelujah. He will save them. They will worship him. They will believe in him because he calms a storm. So Jonah offered himself, throw me overboard. Everything will be calm if you do. But not until after his sin was discovered. God caused that lot to fall to Jonah. There's no such thing as chance. It didn't by chance come up. God caused that lot to show that he was the guilty party. God caused that so that Jonah's sin, his disobedience to God, would be found out. He provided a storm in order to uncover Jonah's sin. Jonah couldn't hide anymore. He does the same with his church when he brings storms. Your sin will be found out, O oh church, with the storm he is bringing. Your sin will be found out and it will be for your own good that he does it. But there's more that God is going to do, O church. Just as with Jonah, when he went into the drink, he was swallowed by a big fish and plunged into darkness for three days and three nights. Same thing happened to Paul after he was struck on the road to Damascus. Three days and three nights of darkness. People say Jonah is a fable that that can't possibly can't survive in a big fish's stomach, but it has been proven to be possible in the natural. But the thought here of God and the heart of God is church, he will plunge you into darkness until you do as Jonah did from that fish's belly and cry out to him. Many of you, O church, are in the fish's belly right now. You are in darkness. You are operating from your own understanding and not God's. In the darkness, Jonah cries out. But he doesn't repent. He just thanks God in advance for saving him. Says he remembers him. And then he'll go do what God asked him to do. God commanded him to do it. His heart's not in it, and I'll explain to you why in a couple minutes. His heart is not in it, but he says the words, I will go and do it. And the church cries out in that dark place where he's put her. And you say that you remember the Lord's faithfulness, And you thank him in advance for bringing you out of the darkness. And you promise to obey him. But church, your heart is not in it. So he'll deliver you when you cry out, O church. And then he's going to command you once again to do what he commanded you to do before, which is to warn the wicked that they must repent from their sin. Because judgment is coming in 40 days. 40 days of God's purpose. 40 days of people being broken before God. People who don't even know him being broken. His church, represented by Jonah, being broken before God. In a storm, in the darkness, coming out. 
Will you now do, O oh church, what the Lord has commanded you to do? Jonah still hates Nineveh. Just like some Christians hate their enemies and those who have spitefully used them instead of praying for them. He very quickly forgets Jonah does. That God saved him very recently when he disobeyed him. Oh, church, you forget. God saved you when you were in the wickedness of your own sin. And he saved you out of your own wickedness. But Jonah, he goes through the motions. He tramps through this great big city and speaks what the Lord commanded him to speak. His heart's not in it. He's just going through the motions. All he says, according to the book of Jonah, is yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. I can see him going through the city, yet 40 days, yet 40 days, yet 40 days. Meanwhile, he's hoping that they won't listen. But Nineveh repents to the max. They immediately believe these half-hearted words coming from Jonah's mouth as being from the Lord, and they repent. They are in sackcloth and ashes, which represents grief and mourning. They mourn, they grieve. Even their animals, they fast. Even their animals, they clothe with sackcloth and don't give them water or food. And they fast. And here's what the king of Nineveh says. This is what he orders. But both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth. And let men, listen, let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way, his wicked way, and from the violence which is in his hands, each man, his own sin, his own wickedness. They do this all because Jonah says, Yet 40 days, and Nineveh will be overthrown without much heart. And then the king says this, who knows? If we do this, God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger from us so that we may not perish. And when God sees their repentance from their wicked ways, he relents. He isn't going to destroy Nineveh. That's his second purpose, folks. First one is to bring mankind, bring his people. The second is to bring mankind to repentance. Repentance, not just a 180, but repentance from their sin. I'm in sin. I turn from it and to God. I am sinning. I turn from it and to God. And I am saved because I repent for my sin. He will spare me. But Northern Israel is like the church today. They didn't repent. So they were put in exile, separated from God, separated from the land, out of the promised land, or they perished in the battles or from hunger.
All of the things, all of the things that go into that. I tell you, O oh church, if you do not repent from your personal sin and from the sin of not telling others to repent for their personal sin, you will either perish or be dragged into exile. Repent first of your own wickedness, and then repent for not clearly telling the world that they must or they will be destroyed. They will perish. What did Jesus say to the Jewish leaders, the people of God, who refused to repent? In Luke 11:32, he said, "The men of Nineveh, the ones I was just talking about, will stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it. Condemn it. Because they repented. The people of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Jesus is here and he is preaching and he is preaching today through me to you, O church. They didn't repent at his preaching, these Jewish leaders. The church doesn't even teach most of Jesus' preaching. They pick out the things that are warm and fuzzy to make sinners feel warm and fuzzy while they go to hell. Shame, church. If you do not repent, O oh church, O oh Christian, the men of Nineveh will stand up against you too and condemn you when you stand before the Lord. How do I know that Jonah's heart is not in it when he says, yet 40 days? Because in Jonah 4, chapter 4, he confesses to the Lord that the reason he ran was because he didn't want them to be, and he knew God would if he went and said what he was supposed to say. God will do it. If you go and say what you're supposed to say, church, God will save people. Truly save them. Not welcome them into a clubhouse. Truly save them. That's what he's here to do. That's his purpose. That's your purpose here. Church. God help us. God help us. So he prays. He confesses, Jonah does, of what God is. He's gracious. He's compassionate. He's slow to anger. He's abundant in loving kindness. He relents concerning calamity. But Jonah does not yet see his heart. He doesn't see that he's not those things toward the Ninevites. He'd rather die than see them spared, he says. He's angry. The Lord asks him if he has a good reason to be angry and to show Jonah his heart. He says, do you have a good reason to be angry? Jonah doesn't see it. Of course I have a good reason to be angry. And he goes to sulk and he goes to watch to see if maybe, in spite of his preaching, Nineveh might be destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah and he can watch. Well, the Lord gives him one day's comfort through the shade of a plant that the Lord lets grow. And Jonah is very happy. Jonah seeks Jonah's happiness. He would be very happy if the people of Nineveh were destroyed. He's very happy that he has the shade of this plant. 
while he hopes for the destruction of hundreds of thousands of people in Nineveh. But then the Lord removes his happiness with a plant withering worm and then a scorching east wind. And Jonah is angrier than ever. So angry he could just die. This isn't right. Why did you take my happiness? And I tell you, the Lord will not let Christians seek their own happiness while those around them are being destroyed. He won't let the church half-heartedly say, yet 40 days. He will remove your protection, O church, for your own good. He will send a scorching wind so you cry out to him. Jonah didn't have a good reason to be angry. God saved Jonah when Jonah repented. Why shouldn't God save whosoever will believe in Jesus Christ, his son, whom he sent, who is the only way and the truth and the life, and no one can come to the Father except by him. The Lord said to Jonah, you enjoyed my protection. You loved it. You didn't work for what you received from me, and you didn't cause it to grow. It came up overnight, and it perished overnight. By the means of that plant-eating worm and that scorching wind. The Lord says, I created the people of Nineveh. I created the animals in there. I caused them to grow. Why should I not have compassion on them? He saves them because they repent of their own personal wickedness, their own sin. They repent. The whole city does. Everything in the city does. The Lord says to Jonah, you want them to perish, Jonah. You don't have my heart and you don't understand my purposes first to get at your heart. So you will repent. And then to get the hearts of those who don't know me yet. I tell you, oh, church, here is what the Lord says This is his conclusion about you based on your actions right now. You must want the wicked to die in their wickedness. And you must want to run and hide from God's purpose, their salvation. And you must want to see them destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? He says, because you aren't warning them to turn from their own personal wickedness to a God who is happy to save and cleanse them. That is his conclusion about much of the church. And so he brings storms to you, O church, and darkness and worms that destroy your comfort and your shade and your protection and scorching east winds. Why? So that you might see your own hearts. May this word go forth as a scorching wind from the Holy Spirit. So that you might see your heart and see that your false depiction of the gospel to people is causing them to go to hell. You are being disobedient and refusing to warn people to repent 
and turn away from their personal sin. And that right quick, because it's through their repentance for their own personal sin that they become children of God and not until, and you cannot disciple them until they belong to God. Oh, church, you must be about the father's business. Warning the wicked of destruction. So they repent and believe in Jesus, who is the only one who can save them. Turn from your rebellion, O church, and the Lord will forgive you. And if you ask him to change your heart, he will do it in a moment of time. Then you will have Jesus's eyes to see. God's heart, God's love, and the power so that when you run into people on the street, they are drawn just by the presence of God, the shining forth from you. And you speak the truth. You are bold because you know the truth. It is through that, that God's great purposes are served. Father, I have come before you with my own heart to make sure that I am doing all that I should do to proclaim the truth. And I am Lord. You showed me this weekend through things that happened. Both Jeff and I, you have changed our hearts, so we have your heart. Your heart is for the church to return to you. For her to acknowledge that she is sinning against you. For her to confess it to you. So you can forgive her and cleanse her. And for a lost world to finally hear the truth. That that the world must repent. Every person. Of their individual sins. And ask Jesus Christ. To forgive them. Jesus. I grieve over your church as you do. I grieve with your grief, but I also know that you will always have a remnant and then you have promised that you will have a church filled with your glory. I believe you. And I believe it's by your Holy Spirit speaking through the prophets you give strength and courage to that your remnant will be large. Holy Spirit, have your way in the hearts of those who listen today. In Jesus' name, amen. The fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. He'll send forth more workers to accomplish his plan and pour out his spirit.